Hey, welcome to our Deep Rooted Ministries Bible Study. We are so glad you could join us tonight. Uh, thank you for everyone who's joining in today. Uh, let us know if you can hear us loud and clear. Let us know in the comments just so we can see um, if, we are, if we're communicating well with you guys or not. And uh, we would love to, to see you guys participate. And in the comment sh uh, section, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, if something reach reaches out to you, uh, go ahead and leave a thumbs up or, or type in a comment, say amen or something like that, just so we know who we are talking to. Thank you. So, um, yeah, my name is Matthew. This is my lovely wife, Stephanie, and we uh, host a little Bible study here in Visalia, California. We are currently in our home. So <laughs> this is where we do our Bible study. This yeah. is where we do everything when it comes to this ministry, and uh, it is such a joy, such a joy to do this with my wife and to do this alongside each other. Um, and so we are glad for everyone, everyone here. Uh, yes, Delton, I can sing <laughs> something <laughs> that's I haven't. That's how we got started. <laughs> yeah, that's how, that's how we met actually is by worship at our church. So um, just for those of you who didn't know, um, that's how we, we met all those years, how many, like six years ago now? Probably Something six around or seven. six or seven years ago, we met in our little worship uh, worship team uh, at our church so just some history for you guys <laughs> but we love that song that song is such a good song um, because just the words in general the the whole half first half of the song is is God talking to us and the second part of the song is our response to him and what we what we say back to him it's such a great great song and it's been on my heart for years and I love that song and finally able to cover it and do it and put it on our Bible study for people to hear is such a good, it's a good thing. Yeah. I'm excited. Um, so we wanted to sing that song though this week because this weekend or tonight we're talking about something very, um, very uh, important for Christians and it's about God and the title of this teaching is, is God out to get me? And basically a lot of Christians have the mentality that God is in control or he works everything in mysterious ways. Um, whenever something happens, whenever something tragic happens to someone, they, people, a lot of, they result to that thinking and that mentality of God works in mysterious ways and his ways are higher than our ways and yada, yada. But throughout scripture, it says that we know the mysteries of God. Yeah. We know his hidden mysteries and we know his will. We know his things. And so... We shouldn't be um, unknowing of why things happen. Yeah. We shouldn't just sit there and scratch our heads and ponder, I wonder what I did this time, or we shouldn't, we shouldn't know why things happen in life. Um, and so tonight we're talking about God and specifically um, chastening. And if he chastens us, how does he do it? Does he do it through hardships? Does he do it through persecution? Does he do it? What, how does he do it? So we're going to go ahead and turn to the Word of God tonight. Um, and simply, people just don't know God's nature. Yeah. They don't know the true nature of our Heavenly Father. And they think He's this, He is Almighty God. Don't get me wrong. He's Almighty God. Just like we sang last week in Elohim. He is, he is the wonderful, wonderful Almighty God from the beginning to the end. But there's a new name to Him that was given to us. Um, and we will get into that tonight. So if you have your Bibles tonight, I encourage you to pull them out because we are going in the trenches with scriptures tonight. <laughs> it is going to be a good, <laughs> good night. Um, so we have about a hundred verses. I'm just kidding. No. We have a lot of verses for you guys tonight. And only because we are very, very passionate about this subject because, um, like I said, a lot of Christians don't know the, the, the love of God. They don't know the true nature, His true love for us. Um, so tonight we're going to be pulling every scripture we can think of um, from our vault just so that we can justify what we're even teaching. And so you can see new light into this whole idea of chast uh, chastisement and all that stuff. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with us to the book of Mark chapter 2 verse 22. And this scripture, we're just going to set the foundation really fast. And literally, all it's saying is that you can't put a new thing in an old container. 
or else it's going to burst. And it's saying it with wine. So uh, Jesus said, And no man puts new wine into old bottles, else the new wine would burst the bottles, and the wine be spilled. And the bottles will be marred, but the new wine must be put in new bottles. So he's saying right here, specifically he's talking about the new covenant versus the old covenant. So what does that mean? Well, if you have your Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. That's all it is. New Testament. New after Testament after Acts, his resurrection. Yeah. On from Acts on is the new covenant. That is the new covenant that he establishes with that Jesus established with us. And so he's talking about there is this new covenant that we that I have to give you, but you can't you can't keep the ideologies and the the theology and all of those rules and laws of the old covenant to have the new covenant. You have to get a, a new container to put the new covenant in. You have to have a new ideology, a new self as it is. And unfortunately for us, when Jesus died, we became new creations. Yeah. So that new creation is what partakes of the new co old covenant, the Old Testament, all the stories you hear from the Old Testament with Moses to Abraham to Job to Jacob to Daniel to Jonah to all of those prophets, those were Old Covenant people. Now, a lot of people are probably going to be saying, well, the Old Testament is still relevant. The Old Testament is, you still have to respect. God is the same yesterday, yeah. today, and tomorrow. And he is, yes. but he operates differently. Yes. And he, we do. We have to respect the Old Testament. We do. We have to respect it. We still study it. We still observe it. We still look at what it says because there are truths in scripture and it tells us it, it pretty much proves to us why we needed mm -hmm. the new testament and the new covenant basically it, it kind of like sets the stage for yeah that because it was incomplete and it didn't mm -hmm. work it was all a shadow of the things to yes. come so the old testament is vital we do need it however it's the old covenant and now that jesus came we have a new covenant to live by so we don't have to the old Te testament the old covenant was right for its time but now there's a new covenant and we can't look at God as the God of the old covenant. We need to look at God as the God of the new covenant because that's the covenant we currently live in. So the foundational scripture for this thing is that is Mark 2, 22, that we have to get a new ideology. We have to get a new covenant. We can't have the old with the new. It has to be only the new. So Romans 8, 15 this was such a, a crazy scripture given to me, given to us, because this is Paul speaking, and he says that you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, where we cry, Abba, Father. Man, so the, one of the things that I noticed that, that came out to us in this scripture is that he's saying that you haven't received the spirit of bondage again. To fear. What was the again part? What were they afraid from first? Yeah. You know? And it wasn't sin. It wasn't death. It wasn't anything else but God's wrath. The wrath of God that was all throughout the Old Testament, slaying 3,000 people um, at Mount Sinai, killing tens of thousands of people. Um, and all, he did a lot of things that he doesn't do today. Yeah. And so, Paul is saying after this new revelation, after this new covenant has come, he's telling us you don't have to be, you're not, you haven't received the spirit of bondage again to the fear that the Old Testament had. You don't have to go through that all over again. But you have received the spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father. You know what this means? Abba, it doesn't mean father as in like, like father. I need this, or like father, like a like a authoritative father. You know, it's not like a like a father. It literally is translated, and I know a lot of people don't like this mm -hmm. when they hear it, but it's the truth. It's translated daddy. Really, it's translated the word daddy, like a child and her and their daddy. That's what this relationship is like. So really, it's saying we're crying, Daddy God. And a, a lot of people don't like the term daddy God, but <clears throat> you don't have to say that. However, understanding that that term Abba Father, it's relating to an, an intimate new relationship with yeah. us and God. It's not almighty God who 
is this and that and can do whatever he wants. It, it, he is that. But when Jesus came, he gave us a new name to call God. It's Abba Father, Daddy. It's our Father. It's our Heavenly Father. I think the reason for that is back then you had to basically, like only priests could basically be in the presence of God back then. Yeah. And you look at, you would treat God like you would treat like the Queen of England mm -hmm. or something, like with high the highest respect. respect. And you, you can't. Now he's trying to show you that you come boldly to the mm -hmm. father, just like a, a little girl running to her father and she mm -hmm. cries, daddy. Like there's that term of endearment because we have that close relationship. Yeah. It's not, he's not far away anymore. Mm -mm. And I love that because it's, it's just, it's a perfect resemblance of like why God made fathers, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a perfect example that we have like a good father to look up to because that should be a resemblance of God and the father and mm -hmm. as our father. And so this is the new name that Jesus gave established for us to call God. And you see it throughout Matthew um, in, in chapter five and six is where he first institutes the word father, heavenly father a, a, in reference to God. Mm -hmm. Everyone else was Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh, all these different names but then Jesus comes here and says, Abba, Father, or Heavenly Father. And so it, it, it's, it says that we're not given that fear, that spirit of fear, but we are given his spirit of adoption. You know why a parent adopts a child? Because they love them. And they choose. When it's different than, than birthing a child. It's mm -hmm. you're choosing that child. Like, I choose you, and mm -hmm. that's what God does with us. He, he chooses each and every one of us. Oh, yeah. And that love, it says that we're not given fear. We don't have fear in us anymore. We don't have fear of God. You know, I reverend God. I, I, I do fear God because He is almighty, but I don't fear Him as in the, the way most people think of God's going to strike me down. I don't, think about I don't think about that because my God... There are so many promises in Scripture of heavenly blessings and spiritual blessings and all these good, exceeding power and greatness that God gives us. So why would He strike me down? Why would He strike me down when the wrath of God was taken on His own literal Son? Yeah. Because of that, I don't, we don't have to experience the wrath. We don't have to experience the anger, the, the fierceness, the almighty power wrath of God that struck down fire at the command of a prophet. We don't have to experience that fear anymore because that's not the God that is here in a way. That, that's his old way. And now the new covenant is here. The spirit of adoption is here. And we, fight, we cry, Abba, Father. And in 1 John 4.18 says it perfectly. That there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Man, so just that the phrase, fear has torment in it. Yeah. I read throughout the Old Testament with all of the killings and all of the, the curses of the law. All of that was torment. All of that was fear. All of that was so, um, it, it was so scary to be around, you know? Like, I can't imagine being in that time period where our gracious Heavenly Father would act like He acted then without, a co without that covenant, mm -hmm. our new covenant. And he acted that way because there was a specific covenant with specific laws saying that you have to follow these laws. And if you don't, this happened. Mm -hmm. And now Jesus, we talked about it last week. Jesus nailed the, the law to the cross when he died and he gave us grace. Yes. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. We don't have to worry about if I don't do this, and if I don't do that, then God's going to punish us. Or there's also that popular, I see it all over social media. Um, with like some of my believer friends um, that when you're going through hardships, any kind of anything confusing in your life um, and you're wondering why it's happening, there's this popular mm -hmm. idea like what can I learn from this? What is mm -hmm. God teaching me during this time? Um, he's hurting me to grow me or something. And that's not it at all because like you said, Jesus nailed the old the old covenant to the mm -hmm. cross. So when you look at in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, where it lists all of the curses it, that would come on you if you broke the law, 
you can see, even though we don't live in that covenant anymore, God still has a standard for what's not good. This is, mm -hmm. he considers sickness, pain, famine, all of those plagues, he considers those a curse. Mm -hmm. So why would you think that if that is coming against you right now in your life, if you're dealing with any of those things, anything bad, um, depression, anxiety, any of those things, um, why would you look at them as a blessing from yeah. God trying to teach you something? If mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, it's clear that that was considered a curse, yeah. a curse that would come if you broke the law. Mm -hmm. So as an if, we then. have to know that those things do not come from God. God can use he can make good of those things. Yes. He can, uh, we end up coming out stronger when those things come against us because of God's grace. Mm -hmm. But he's never the cause of mm -hmm. it. He doesn't inflict it. He doesn't have, you know, and there's a huge scope of like what people consider affliction, you know, and what is affliction. And it's like she says, sickness is affliction. It is not something God puts on us. Not a blessing Financial <laughs> problems is not something from God. You know, people use the excuse saying that uh, the gate and, and, and he was asking for silver and gold and he says, silver and gold, I have none, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, get up. People like to say Peter was broke. <laughs> Peter had no money because he was a Christian, because he was a disciple. And people like to um, bash prosperity, mm -hmm. bash prosperity because they feel it's ungodly, but friends, prosperity is godly. Prosperity is what God wants. You know, it takes money to do this. It takes money yeah. to do what we're doing right now. And to some people will say, well, just do it on a lesser value, a lesser quality, do it with your phone, just do it simple. Well, you can, however, there's a wisdom to go about doing everything. And if high produced stuff is gonna reach more people, then so be it, yeah. you know, we're probably, Imagine, imagine a huge ministry you're want, you, you love to watch, a huge church or a huge ministry. You know, we're only online right now, worldwide is online churches. So imagine a church you watch on Sunday and them just streaming it from their phone. <laughs> they wouldn't be where they're at if they, if they just did that, if they didn't go to the next level. Yeah. I used to be one of those people that like, I would kind of shy away from churches or preachers that I could see had a lot of money because I felt like, oh, that can't be good. Like. Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. Why do they have so much money? And then when I had the revelation that, you know, Jesus didn't just die for our salvation, but he died for our healing and for our prosperity so we can live an abundant life. Yeah. I will never again. It, it's a heart issue. Mm -hmm. The love of money is what's ungodly. Mm -hmm. So when all that's in your heart is a love for money, then it's ungodly. Yeah. But Absolutely. if you trust in the Lord and you trust that he's a good God and he loves to bless his children, there's like an abundance and an overflow of blessings that can come mm. on your life. And it's so sad that people have that mindset that it's ungodly because all they're doing is shutting off mm -hmm. the, the they're door. Closing they're door. closing that door to those blessings because they can't accept mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's just, that's definitely wrong thinking. Mm -hmm. So don't, and to take everything to scripture, but yes. don't just believe when someone says that prosperity is of the devil or uh, sickness is God's way of healing or uh, uh, of, of teaching you something. God will never, ever, ever, ever chastise us through a hardship, through a sickness, through a divorce, through a death. He will never teach us lessons by doing that. And like she said, he will use it and shape it to our good. The Bible says that he uses those things for those who love him. So if you're acti actively loving him and actively pursuing him, then you're gonna see, a, a, you're gonna see the rainbow on the other side, yeah. you know. But if you're not, if you're just someone who literally lives in the world and you go to church, but you don't, you're not a Christian or anything, and you say God works all things to those who, well, you're not actively loving him, mm -hmm. you know. But um, say God doesn't chastise us through hardships alone or through hardships at all, yeah. and so. Look, let's look at Matthew 7, 7 through 11. It says, Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. For everyone that asks receives. And he that seeks finds. And him that knocks will be open. Or what man is there of you whom his son will ask for bread? Will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil, how... How, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, 
give you good things to them that ask him. Man. And you know, Jesus isn't saying that you're evil, but in we comparison. are in comparison to God. Yes. So if our natural selves know how to give, give good gifts, how much more can our father give stuff to us, yeah. our heavenly even, father? Even in the world, like even the world has some kind of idea of what it means to be a good father. Mm -hmm. Like people that are completely not Christians, there's still that standard, like a father that's present, a father that's a provider, mm -hmm. a father that's a protector, like all of those things, even the world, people in the world see that as, you would consider them <coughs> a good father. Mm -hmm. So how much more can our heavenly father give I us know. good things? Like if there's still that standard and we being evil, like the Bible says, um, knows how to give good things to our children. God is so much greater and mm -hmm. loves us so much greater than our earthly fathers could ever love oh, yeah. us. It's, it's, I love thinking about it because I, we're, we are without need. Yes. <laughs> we are without need. You know, even later um, or earlier in, in scripture in Matthew, in Matthew 6, he's saying, behold, look at the fowls of the air. They don't sow anything or they don't reap anything, but God feeds them. Are you not much better than them? And he says, wherefore, if God is clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? And so there, Jesus, Jesus is there again, identifying our heavenly father, not this crazy wrathful God. It's our heavenly Abba, our daddy, our father, our, our personal intimate, dad and he's setting the idea that god is our father in the most intimate way yeah. he knows you like a father knows uh, their child's needs you know we are without need then the bible says for your heavenly father knows that you have need of all things yeah. so he already knows he knows all of that so nothing comes by surprise he's already there he already knows what we need and how much more will he give to us when he gives to the whole everything else the birds the grass, the lilies, all of that mm. stuff. It's so, so beautiful, really, what Jesus, uh, what's the word? Conveyed yeah. for, for God. Um, Ephesians, let's go to another scripture. Ephesians 1, 19, 23 says this, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is not named, not only in this world, but that is which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things in the church, which is the body, his body, to the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So, a lot of words there. <laughs> but literally, all it's saying is that when Jesus died and rose from the dead, God placed him in heavenly places above everything that has a name. Yeah. Sickness, disease, cancer, COVID, uh, bankruptcy, everything that has a name that is contrary to his will, he is above. Yeah. But then, that's the end of chapter 1. Then chapter 2 begins, and remember, the Bible didn't have chapters when they wrote it. Yeah. We just put it in. Um, we just put it in. <laughs> our dog did something really weird right now. <laughs> but man, man put in chapters to organize the Bible. Yeah. So immediately after that, it says, And you hath he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sin. And then in verse 4 it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead with sins, had quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and he's raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That the age in the ages to come he'll show his exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Man, this isn't talking about heaven, you guys. This is talking about yes. right now. We are seated with Christ right now. And that means every bad thing that has a name is underneath our foot yeah. it is our footstool just like it is with jesus yeah and i love this because all of this is just showing the character mm -hmm. it's showing god's true nature and how he loves us and that it, it, he his love for us is what 
is the only reason why he sent Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like that was the only reason why, because yeah. he loved us so much. Mm -hmm. And you guys, let hear our hearts. We're not saying God is weak. We're not saying God doesn't have power. He has all the power in the world. He created everything. But when Jesus died, he then gave us that power, that authority. Yeah. And it's only by God's grace, by his love and his mercy, just like it said, that in the ages to come, he'll show us the riches, the exceeding riches of his grace and in his kindness. So it is only by God's grace is any of this that we're talking about even possible. Mm -hmm. But what part of showing us the riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus is harmful. Yeah. What what part of that is a hardship? Yeah. <laughs> you I read this scripture and I'm like I'm just like trying to find where's the sickness? Yeah. Where's the disease we have to go through? Where's the crushing we have to experience? Where's all these bad things that everyone says we have to go through yeah. to get to our calling? It's nowhere in scripture. Nowhere. So where does chastening begin? How how do we get how do we get uh chastened, chastened, ch chastised, all of that, whatever those words are. How do we do that? Well, the Bible says that God doesn't tempt us with evil things. So in James it says, let, man, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and neither tempt he any man. Then in, chapter, in verse 17, it says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights from whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning of his own will be gat oh i love this part of his own will be gat he us with the word of truth translation he will give us the word of truth that we should be kind of first fruits so that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures so so god gives us his word, the word of truth, that we should be fruitful, yeah. that we should be exactly how he created us to be. Yeah. How, did, how was that? Well, look at the Genesis account when he made man. He said, let us create man in our own image, our exact likeness, the same exact copy, literally, as God. Let us make him in our own image to subdue the whole earth. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's saying, and here, that he gave us the word of truth so that we could bear fruit of like the first fruits of his creatures, yeah. of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were the, one of the first fruits of his creation. And you, sh you see how they were supposed to live on the earth. And with the word, everything good comes from the Lord, the Bible says. So rule of thumb, if it's bad, it's from the enemy. If it's good, it's from God. Yeah. Rule of thumb. Always. Uh -huh. And it only can be good according to scripture. Yeah. If it's robbing a bank and getting away with it, you might consider that good. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not good, that's stealing. So it, it's only good according to scripture. But everything good comes from the Lord. If you had someone who passed away in your life at a young age and you think, why did God take them? Why did God didn't take them. The lie is that God needed them in heaven more than he needed them on earth. That is not true. God is without want, he is without need. He doesn't need anything so he wouldn't take someone just to have them in heaven yeah. but also <clears throat> that is from the enemy yeah it's kill steal destroy that's from the enemy yeah. and i think a lot of people use that kind of thinking to cope with the situation because a lot of the times you're praying and you're believing in faith that this person will be healed mm -hmm. or that this situation will change and when it doesn't the la your last resort is to think oh well what what can I learn from this? Mm -hmm. What was God trying to teach me? Because there's just that confusion. You don't know the true nature of God. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's just that confusion there, and the enemy likes to play on that. And it's so good when you have the that true revelation of who God is and how um, He's unchanging and He's consistent. Like there, you read in the New Testament, like there is a consistency yeah. to God then you know, okay, well then it must be, it, not that I deserved it or that I did something to make it happen, but I live in a fallen world. I'm still in my human flesh. Yep. Something, at least it, it wasn't my perfect God that yeah. did this. 
somewhere. Yeah. Thank it, God it yeah, wasn't honestly, God. Thank, <laughs> thank God it's not his fault. Because yeah. if it's his fault, then we're we we are helpless. Yeah, we can't do perfect. anything. Uh -huh. And so if we know that we are still in our human flesh, imperfect, then we know like okay, well it had to be something in on this end, mm -hmm. on the earthly end, that that took place, and that's why it happened. I'm still in a fallen world, mm -hmm. so even if I don't understand exactly what took place, I know that it wasn't God because I know that God's good and He's perfect, mm -hmm. and I'm not there yet, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely, and you know. You have to differentiate. <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> you have to discern what's good, what's what's from God, and what's from the enemy. You have to know. You you have to know the two. The Bible says in James again, "Submit yourself therefore to God, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you." How can you resist the enemy if you think it's from God? Exactly. How can you resist a a trial, a hardship, if you think God sent it? Yeah. You know. Uh, and people think I, it's absurd for me when I hear people say that they think God gave them a sickness, but yet they're still taking over the counters and they're yeah. still taking Advil and they're still taking a, 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 what is it called? When you go to the doctor and get a prescription, you're, you're still taking all that stuff, yet you think God sent it to you. Well, Whatever God's will, like, mm -hmm. uh, well, I just want God's will to be done. And mm -hmm. it's like they have this thinking that God is mysterious and mm -hmm. he works in mysterious ways and you might not see why something's happening, but God knows. And that's not true at all. Since mm -hmm. he gave us the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. we now know the mysteries of God. Mm -hmm. Like he's made them known to us. The Bible says various times mm -hmm. that he's made known the mysteries to us because through the Holy Spirit and through the word, mm -hmm. we now know what basically what God knows because he's, yeah. he's allowed us to know that now. And we don't, we, <clears throat> we have, the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. Yes. But that's a lifelong process of renewing. Of renewing. Uh, if, if I told you I know everything, <laughs> I'd be lying to you. But from where I was two years ago, a year ago, three years ago, to now, I can tell you I have so many more answers that I could have given myself three years ago if I were to be in the Word as much as I am now. I, I would know the answers to a lot of stuff um, and if you're a pastor watching this at all, you need to rely on the Holy Spirit and on the Word to reveal those mysteries to you because you can't pastor a church if you don't have answers. Yeah. You, you can't lead people if you don't know. You know? It, it, it takes more than just knowing the fundamentals. Jesus died and saved you. We're not meant to make converts. We're meant to make disciples. And if you don't know why we go through hardships if you don't know why this happened if you don't know then you're you're leading blindly because these people are looking to you for the, they should be looking to god but a lot of people need a natural means of understanding stuff so they look to their pastor and they try to find answers and so most pastors that's just the will of god or it's just the mystery of god no one who knows that's not an answer that people are looking for and if you need to know, I'm just going to say that, you just need to know, find out what the heck the mysteries are, mm -hmm. because, I, now again, I can't tell you I know everything. But the but, information is available. Yes. Like it's available for us to find out. Mm -hmm. And nine times out of ten, I could, we could tell you the thing, like why, why something took place, you know. But we can't tell you exactly because we don't know the root of people's heart. We don't know um, the, the, the true intention of things that happened. If someone passed away and they're believing for healing, we're not just going to say you have doubt because you don't know where the person who was dying, where they were at with their faith, where they were at with their doubt. So you could have had the perfect, the, the, like you, you could have had the renewed mind. You could have had the faith of a mustard seed that is perfect to heal someone. But if they didn't want it deep down in their heart, then they didn't want it and it wasn't going to happen. So I can't, we can't like say like, your doubt caused it or this doubt because again we don't know people down in the hearts but, but we can't for the say majority it, wasn't God. Mm -hmm. it was not god absolutely it was not god so with that that leads to double mindedness yes. and double mindedness is simply put here if you any if any of you lack wisdom let him ask god that he gives to you liberally and upbraideth not and he will give it to him but let him ask in faith with nothing wavering for he that wavers is like a wave in the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For let that man think he shall not receive anything 
of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So what's wavering? <laughs> wavering is saying, I, I know the Bible says that no weapon formed against me will prosper. But sometimes God allows bad things to happen in our life to teach us something. <laughs> you just contradicted yourself. Yes. If no weapon formed against you will prosper, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Yeah. You can't sit there and say that and say, well, God allowed it to happen. That just means God completely voided his word and allowed something to happen to you just to teach you something. Yeah. And the Bible also says that his word never comes back void, yeah. ever. And that kind of thinking, it just, it really hurts you because mm -hmm. like like that scripture says you, you come and ask him in faith nothing wavering because he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and mm -hmm. tossed it's unstable mm -hmm. so when you come the bible says come boldly mm -hmm. before before with the lord confidence. how do you come boldly to the lord believing for something when deep down you're like uh, but I don't know, like if it's the Lord's will for me to be healed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, but I'm believing I'll be healed. Lord, I want to be healed. Please heal me. But deep down, you're questioning. What if this? What if He's trying to teach me something? Mm -hmm. What if it's my time to go? Like you have all of these thoughts. You can't come boldly to Him when you're double-minded. Mm -mm. There's instability. Yep. And you, you can't expect to receive because you aren't al allowing that mm -hmm. to happen. You're, you're too confused to receive His blessing. You know, I love the scripture where the, the man, the, the leper came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you are willing, will you heal me? And he didn't, he didn't doubt if God could. He doubted if he would. Mm -hmm. And right there, Jesus answered every person has ever asked that question, if you're willing. He said, I will be clean. That was it. That was the answer. So if you're ever asking yourself, if it's the Lord's will for me to be healed, it is. Yeah. It is God's will for you to be healed from any anything. Mm -hmm. every Everything that has broken you physically, relationally, emotionally, he, that healing is available to you. Yeah. And one of the indicators of why you're not receiving healing is probably because of a double mind. You think one way and you think another way. You think God can, but you don't think he will. You think God will, but you don't think you deserve it. There's a lot of double-mindedness that a lot of believers deal with. And another double-minded example is from John 15. This is about the true vine. And um, it says this, Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch that is that in me that bears not fruit is taken away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, a lot of people, stop there. they stop right there, and they say, God purges us, you know, and... Cuts they, off those uh -huh, branches that aren't bearing prunes, fruit. Prunes, and it, 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 this is the King James. <laughs> it says he purges it, and a lot of translations say prunes. And so what people do, they look at the word prune and they look up the definition and it means to, to cut away the branches, to, yeah, to cut all that stuff. And they say, God will cut you off so that he could teach you something. God will do this so he can. But <laughs> the verse three says, now Jesus saying, now you are clean through the word I have spoken unto you. Yeah. That's it. The word purging translated literally means to clean to make clean that's it jesus doesn't, didn't say god's gonna cut you off and god's gonna do this and god's gonna throw this and blah 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 he says that he'll clean you to bear more fruit and then what did he say now you're clean through the word i've spoken to you so how do we get clean through the word of god he's telling us here that the word alone is enough to teach us to clean us to yeah. to to direct us and that's what verse 3 is talking about. And to just put more validation on that scripture, let's go to Hebrews 12, 7 through 8. <clears throat> and it says, this is where chastening, chastening comes in. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? You know, I don't know about you guys, 
but I got spanked. <laughs> my dad spanked me so much. I'm going to spank our children. I don't think it's a harmful thing, but I grew up all right. But uh, God disciplines us like fathers discipline their children. But when my dad would spank me, the pain was never, ever inhumane. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't inhumane. It was, it was a quick, it was a quickening because it, it was fast. But <clears throat> if my dad were to cut my arm off oh my <laughs> to say, listen to me next time, son, that would be inhumane. That He'd would lose be, all his rights. Yeah. He would go, father. he would be put in jail. So what makes you think God would give you cancer to teach you something? You know, that's just deadly. That's just harmful. And yeah. earlier, it says that we read it earlier to, uh, together where it says that um, we haven't been given the spirit of fear. And then in another scripture, it says that there's no fear in love because fear has torment. Mm -hmm. So what do you think's tormenting? Cancer is tormenting. A sickness is tormenting. Being broke is tormenting to all some people. All of that people. stuff creates fear also. Absolutely. And you can trust in the Lord all you want, but if you believe God's doing that, then what do you have hope for? Yeah. If God's doing that to you, what else is he going to do? He might do something worse to you. And that's not our Heavenly Father at all. But in here, it literally, in Hebrews, God will chasten us, chasten us, whatever, chasten. <laughs> chasten us like our Father will chasten a child. And... Every child that has gotten abused or beaten has lost their father because of the rights and issues and all that because their father was crazy. But yet God is still with us. God is still here with us. God still deals with us in a gentle way. So how the heck does the Lord chase us? Because all it says is that if you endure it, then he deals with you as sons. But it doesn't actually say in this scripture what is chastisement. Yeah. It doesn't say so Jesus kind of said it, how by my word you are clean. But let's go to one more scripture in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. This is my favorite scripture of all time because it's the truth. Yes. And all the scriptures are the truth. But <laughs> it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. In other words, it is useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness wow instruction in righteousness that the man of god may be perfect thoroughly thoroughly finished unto all good you know <laughs> it was funny because i uh a while ago i was talking to uh a, like a, a staff i guess a couple of pastors from a different church and i was uh they were asking me some questions and they're like what books do you like to read and all that stuff oh, yeah. and just to be blunt, I don't really read that much. I, the only book I'm willing to pick up is the Bible, um, but I will pick up another book if I have to for work or whatever. We're but, very picky. Cause we do yeah, read, we're picky. But we're very mm -hmm. careful with what we're going to read. But, yeah, but we, we really only read the Bible as much as we can or books that are literally just drenched with Scripture in yes. them, explaining them. I don't care for opinions or leadership opinions that just say the same thing over and over from chapter 1 to 34 but so i only read really scripture <clears throat> and so they asked well, what books do you like to read what are you reading currently blah, blah, blah. and so i told them i was like well i don't really read that much uh books i like reading the, the bible and then they're like well you have to read other people's opinions on the bible it's how, it it's how, it's how you grow it's how you that's how you grow and i was like to an extent yeah absolutely um but I said, I, I believe scripture is profitable for perfecting me to do ministry and, or to run a business if you're a business owner or to have a family. And so I said that <coughs> and they're like, well, no, you, you can't, uh, <laughs> you can't uh, do that and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, well, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, and it'll make the man perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And they were like, what translation is that? And I was like, it's just the Bible. It's what the Bible says. And it's literally what the Bible says. And they were just dumbfounded yeah. that I used that scripture to justify why I believe scripture is profitable for everything. 
and for perfecting us in every area. You know, the Bible doesn't come back void. So why would this be in there if it was void? Yeah. If it says um, that it's profitable for doctrine and reproof, for correction, instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works if they read this, and then if they go to Bible college, and then if they go to this, and if they hear this podcast. Like, then... You're relying on men. <clears throat> exactly. Basically. And so, with the Holy Spirit and with the Word of God, we are able to be corrected, taught, instructed, perfected, thoroughly furnished, What is a furnished thing? Well, a lot of houses, you can either buy them furnished or unfurnished. Unfurnished means it's completely empty. And furnished means it has all of the furniture in it ready to move in. We've been watching Fixer Upper. And there's a lot of houses that are ready to move in. And the Bible says that there is, that the Word of God can make you perfect, thoroughly furnished, ready to do the good works. And so when I read that, I believe with all of my heart that the word alone has the power to make us perfect for ministry, yeah. perfect for business owning, perfect for family life. And it has to be centered around God. And there are go- there's a lot of godly mm-hmm. counsel and wisdom that you can get from other yes. people, from pastors. We're not saying that, that's, that you should never trust Absolutely. anyone. But at the same time, you have to understand you need to know the word mm-hmm. because people will say things out of their flesh. like, And they don't mean to, but mm-hmm. it's only because they might not know the word or they just yeah. had a, a, a second of speaking in their flesh. And that can really make an impact on you. I, I wrote a blog a couple months ago and I kind of touched on this subject a little bit too. But when we were dating, <clears throat> oh my gosh, we had a lot of issues when we were dating, but... We read a lot (laughs) of dating, of of books on dating, on relationships, on how to be in a godly relationship. The engagement quiz. Oh my gosh, that was the worst. (laughs) But we were just trying our hardest to just have a godly relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, it was, there was some wisdom in it, but most of those books really... They destroyed us. They made our relationship so Mm -hmm. much worse. They really did, and I'm not going to blame the people that wrote them. I It was just me and my ignorance thinking that these books were truth, basically. Mm-hmm. And if, if I would have known the Word, and I know and if I knew what the Word says on how to lead a godly relationship and how to treat my significant other, I would have been able to identify right away, oh, that's not Scripture, that's yeah. not biblical, like I, that's not good. Um, but I didn't. And so we were reading those books and they actually caused a lot of harm to our relationship. Mm -hmm. And not every book is going to do that. But if you don't know the word, then how will you know if what the Mm -hmm. book is saying is truth? And the same thing with a pastor or um, a close friend, a mentor. You have to know the word very well Mm -hmm. in order to um, make sure that the advice that you get from outside sources don't harm you. Yeah. Rather and that's why we say take everything to Scripture. Yes. Everything. Everything. Because even what we tell you guys, take it to Scripture yes. because we're not perfect. But we try our hardest to make sure everything is scripturally accurate and that it's actually effective and it works. Yes. Because if it's not working in our life, then what good will it do to you yeah. if it doesn't work in our lives? Mm-hmm. But it's so funny too because we don't really label ourselves like Pentecostal or a baptism or what all those people like we don't have a label i tell my i tell people that i'm just a, a word believer that's it but i was talking to um albert yesterday oh my God. and um i was talking to him and we're just discussing a little bit of different things and here and there and talking about like how the body can heal itself and all of that stuff and he got into like the the science of the body and how in our body that we have muscle or systems and in the systems there's muscles in those muscles there's cells, and in those cells, there are molecules, and in those molecules, there's subatomic particles, and in those particles are uh, uh, what are ne- neutron- neutrons, 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 mm-hmm. and in those neutrons are atoms, yeah. and atoms. Have, so we, like we went to like the the deepness of that, but <clears throat> the way I believe, he would when I would say certain things, um, he would say like, that sounds universalism, or that sounds. Uh, that sounds Calvinist. And whenever I had meetings with him back in the day, we'd talk about beliefs. That would sound Calvinist, or that sounds that. And he would start to say, like, 
certain things that I would say sounded like different doctrines mm -hmm. because, and I don't even research those doctrines. Yeah. I don't research universalism. I don't research, I don't care to research those things, but it's funny because I read the word and then like a bunch of different doctrine ideas are like formed in one because not one doctrine is completely um, sound. You know, if it's a Calvinist doctrine, there's going to be some mistakes in there. If it's a Baptist, there's going to be mistakes in that. Yeah. If there's Pentecostal, there's going to be mistakes. So it's, you can't label what you are because there's going to be holes and flaws in your doctrine. But when I don't label myself and I just read scripture for what it is and believe it and believe in the consistency of what we believe, it kind of comes in all these different categories showing like, the Bible is not a doctrine. The Bible is life. It is a lifestyle. It is the yeah. way of life. And I thought it was really interesting seeing how like, how we believe like pulls from different, different doctrines and stuff because some of them have truth and some of them don't, but then mm -hmm. there's still small truth in others and all of that. Yeah, I'm so but, glad we started <clears throat> doing that because that's the reason why we mm -hmm. stopped going to Bible college because we found that it wasn't where we were supposed to be anymore. As we grew in the word and our knowledge of the word, we realized a lot of the things that we were being taught mm -hmm. that maybe other people kind of just held, like they grabbed onto it as truth because they didn't know any better. We realized because we knew the word, when we would be in, um, in like lectures or be doing assignments or reading books that we were supposed to read for assignments, um, we'd realize, oh, that's, that's not <laughs> scripture. That's not biblical. <clears throat> yeah. And um, it sucks because it, we were already going through Bible college when we realized that. But um, mm -hmm. but that's why it just it, it proves that you need mm -hmm. to know the word. Because if, if you don't know the word, whatever people tell you, you're mm -hmm. going to take as truth. And I totally forgot why I even said that whole doctrine thing <laughs> until right now. <laughs> I just kind of went with the flow. But I said that because there's a danger when you're... Um, when you're when you're studying a bunch of different stuff, you know, a, 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 different, a bunch of different pastors, a bunch of different denominations, a bunch of different doctrines, because you get confused in the head. Yeah. You know, I uh, I heard a story here locally where someone got hired on the church, and um, their staff required everyone to like read like a ton of books a year, and the person who got hired was very immature in their faith, and they started doing it, and because they started doing it. Then they got into like the doctrine of like there's no hell, there's no heaven, like there's no this and that. They're still Christians, but they didn't believe in like heaven or hell. It was weird because they stumbled across like books like from Rob Bell who doesn't believe in hell. Like they stumbled across different books and people who believe way different things than what scripture teaches. And it threw it completely just destroyed their belief. It complete and because they filled themselves up with just so much stuff. From different people and not just the word they got confused yeah. and that's where a lot of Christians are today yeah. they're double-minded because they hear this pastor saying healings out of today and then they hear this pastor say command it to leave and then they hear this one say God does it to teach you so it's like well which one they get so confused and a lot of people say like oh you know you just have to like chew the meat and spit out the bone or like just if you hear something that's that's not right it's okay just disregard it but mm -hmm. I feel like there's still a danger in doing that mm -hmm. you really have to be careful with what you allow into your into your mind mm -hmm. and what you allow yourself to hear because the Bible says when you communicate with evil it's gonna corrupt you bad just like if you're if you're listening to things with bad words or mm -hmm. you're listening to explicit content or watching things that you shouldn't be watching it's going to corrupt you. Mm -hmm. It will. The Bible says there's no doubt about it. If you don't think that it's going to affect you, you're deceived. And I feel like there's a danger mm -hmm. in even doing that with different doctrines, different religions, because when you fill your mind with that, mm -hmm. it's going to corrupt you somehow. Mm -hmm. And you're deceived to think that it won't. Mm -hmm. And so you need to know the Word of God. You need mm -hmm. to know it more than anything mm -hmm. that's in order to, to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. Mm -hmm. That's why I say just try to avoid labeling yourself mm -hmm. try to avoid i'm a word of faith or i'm a grace or i'm a blah 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 just believe in the bible believe in the word of god and it'll do so much benefit there was no such thing as a baptist or a pentecostal or a word of faith back in jesus's times mm -hmm. back in this there was just the bible you know it wasn't until all the denominations and constantine came and all this stuff to where this thousands of thousands of denominations were made and that's where it all got jacked up. But 
Just believe in the word. But I wanted to point out one thing in that scripture that how it says that it's profitable, that scripture is profitable for instruction in righteousness. Well, the word chastening in Hebrews 12 that we read earlier, it's, it literally is translated the exact same word as instruction here in 2 Timothy. And it also means disciplinary correction, training, educating, instruction in nurture. So when we're being chastened by God, we are being instructed. We are being disciplined with, by correction. We are being educated by the word and we are being nurtured by God. That's how we get chastened. Not by hardships, not by this and that and, and disease and blah, blah, blah. We are only chastened by the word of God. It instructs us. It teaches us. It does so many good things to us. And he, also in Hebrews, let me see if I can pull it up on my phone. I don't have it in our notes, but in, uh, in Hebrews, it, was, it also mentions that, I'm going to just try to find it really fast. If I can't find it within the next like 30 seconds, then I'll move on. But let's see where we are. Seven. So then it says this. So after verse eight, it says, let's see, let's see. In verse 11, it says, Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And the Bible says that it is perfect for instruction in righteousness. Now, the reason why it is not joyous and it's grievous because it's because it's talking about resisting from temptation. When you're being chastened by the word, the word instructs us what to do, what not to do, what to listen to, what not to listen to, what to partake of, what not to partake of. Now, I'll give sexual morality for an example. If you struggle with sexual immorality in any areas and you resist it, you resist the temptation or you resist falling into the temptation, it's not going to be fun. <laughs> it's not going to be fun. It's going to be hard. It's going to be grievous. It's going to take some work. It's going to take effort. It's not going to be a walk in the park. But afterwards, it says it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And the word righteousness translated literally means um, justified. Justified and in right standing or worthy of the calling, basically. And it's not saying that God will look at you righteous because you're already righteous in his eyes but what it is saying is that after you've with withheld from sexual morality for the example from sexual immorality and you've withheld from the temptation you've overcome the temptation you can look back and say man i got through it and then you can help someone else get through it you can be justified for your works because if you are struggling with temptation like that and you're falling into it day in and day out all the time how can you lead someone else through that when you're still struggling? So that's why it says that it is for instruction in righteousness. And then here it says that it leads us to the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So unto them who practice being chastened, practice listening to the word, with, withhold from immorality of any sort. And so it doesn't do anything. God doesn't look at you different or anything like that. For you, in your mind, you have peace at mind knowing I'm like, I, I don't have the, like a struggle. Like, you know, like I overcame something. I can help someone overcome something too. And that's what it, that's what it's referring to here. That it's an instruction for righteousness. It instructs us to be worthy of the calling to help us help others. Yeah. So when we say the word of God is perfect for everything, it really, really is. I hope, I hope someone received that word today because it's a good one. It's, It'll change your life. It'll change the way you look at God for the rest of your life, you know? Yeah. I will never look at God again and say that a sickness or anything harmful is from Him because it is not. It is not. So I just want to encourage you um, to take away some things. And it's just remember that you are free from the spirit of bondage to fear. You're free from that. You don't have to worry about God hurting you. God teaching you through hardship or allowing things into your life for you to be 
disciplined. That's not how God operates anymore. The new covenant established, the grace covenant established, is what we live by. It's what we live in, day in, day out, by grace, through faith. Secondly, is God doesn't operate as he did in his old covenant because Jesus gave us a new covenant establishing God as our Father, Abba, Father, our Daddy, God. And thirdly, understanding that the Word of God is enough to correct, teach, discipline, instruct, anything like that, that will set you free from the snare of the enemy. And the snare of the enemy is trying to get you into deception, into the deception of oh, this is from God, this divorce is from God, God wants you to divorce someone. You know, if that's happening, that is going to destroy you. Divorce is not godly. It's like ripping together two glued pages and just ripping them apart. It is harmful. It is not God's will for you. It is not God's best. If you've been divorced, there is healing. There is wholeness. God can be there. God is your restorer. There is still grace. The Bible says that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. And then it says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So there's always goodness and mercy following you no matter where you go. And lastly, you can truly resist the enemy and submit to God when you know where the affliction comes from. When you know where it comes from, you know how to deal with it. And when you know how to deal with it, that's when you become free. You know, the Bible says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So I am praying that whoever is listening to this, that you were open to hearing the truth and to knowing the truth. And it's not just the truth you know. It's the truth that sets you free. It's the truth that you are in and it'll set you free. So I, I really hope that this blessed you tonight. Uh, we have communion coming up right now. So if you have your elements, go ahead and get them out. We're about to go partake in our communion for the week. Man, that was a good word. I love... Um, what does it mean grace camp versus faith camp? Oh. I'll let you respond to that, Mary. <laughs> also, if you guys don't know Mary, she's a phenomenal person. She's such a cool person. She's one of our good, good friends. Um, she's very, very knowledgeable when it comes to the word. It is a blessing to have her as a friend. Um, so if you have your community elements, if you've never taken communion, all we're doing <clears throat> is remembering exactly what took place on the cross and what happened. What happened when this new covenant was given to us? Um, the bread here symbolizes Jesus' broken body. It was the body that he went on the cross and he went to the cross and his body was beaten. His body was scourged. It was whipped. And the Bible says that his face, um, his vicious was marred more than any man in the sons of man. Basically saying he didn't even look human anymore. <laughs> human. And it wasn't simply because of the beatings. It was part of that. But it was also because of all of the pain, all of the diseases, every disease that was known to man and not known to man for this day and age, that was put on Jesus. That was put on his body so that you and I would never have to deal with it. And we do live in a fallen world. Sickness does appear. Uh, things do happen. And we need to take our rightful authority and submit to God and resist the enemy. And so but hopefully by this teaching, most of you are enlightened by that God doesn't inflict hardships. God doesn't inflict pain or suffering on us to teach us anything. And the proof in the pudding is right here in the bread. It's that he did it. He put his whole wrath on Jesus so that we wouldn't have to bear the punishment. So if you have your elements, um, we'll just put them in our hands and we'll uh, just remember everything that Jesus did for us on the cross. So have your elements and we'll go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. 
We thank you for we thank you for the punishment that Jesus went through, the wrath that was put on Jesus so that we wouldn't have to deal with it, Lord. For the punishment, Lord, that that killed your son that would have been on us if it weren't for him. So Lord, we thank you right now. We hold this bread and we thank you for the promise, the new covenant, everything in the Old Testament, all of the old curses, the curse of the law was nailed to the cross so that we could have grace, freedom, liberty, and salvation. And so we love you, Lord. We thank you. And then we pray. Amen. You can eat. Our dog's really excited right now. <laughs> this is the beauty of, of beginning ministries. In our home, humble abode, renovated house, with our dog running around in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, next is the wine. The wine symbolizes the blood of Christ shed for us. The bread took care of the physical, and the blood takes care of the spiritual. And because Jesus died, his blood was shed for us so that he was that perfect sacrifice that took place in the Old Testament. You ever wonder why no one's sacrificing goats anymore? Because... The old sacrifice, the Old Testament, has been done away with. God, Christ fulfilled it, and now we have a new covenant. Just like we don't sacrifice animals anymore, we don't have to live in fear of God striking us down anymore. So with the blood, the blood represents our eternal salvation. The sins that were washed away, past, present, and even future sins. That's right, future sins. So God even knows the sins will commit before we even commit them. And he already forgave us of all of those sins, allowing us to walk in life, walk in no condemnation. The Bible says that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And it allows us to live in righteous, in right standing, in confidence. We can approach his throne in confidence because of the blood that was shed for us. So if you have your element, I encourage you to hold it and thank the Lord. Thank him for his the blood shed for us to become righteous and for our salvation so that we could have a perfect relationship with you without blemish, without spot. And God, we thank you. We can't thank you enough, but we thank you as much as we can, Lord, for that sacrifice that was made for us. It shows how much our dad, our, how heavenly father loved us by sacrificing his son. So we thank you and we love you in your name. Amen. Well, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, if any of you have questions, feel free to drop them in right now. We went a little over on accident this time, but hey, it's okay. Um, so, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them down. Um, that pretty much concludes our Bible study. If you were blessed by our Bible study, we do encourage you to donate, to give. Um, there is a lot of blessings in giving. There's a lot of um, things that you wouldn't know about your life that will happen when you start giving. Suddenly, financial prosperity is heading your way. And suddenly, all these blessings. The Bible says that um, to give and see not the, he the windows of open pour on your life. So giving is one way. Uh, you can also support us just by um, donating any materials, any music equipment. We've been doing worship now. And so uh, we are in need of equipment. We are in need of getting some music stuff so that we can produce even better stuff for our ministry. Um, so if you felt led, you can go ahead and give at deeprootedministries.com slash give. It would be a blessing to us and to you as well. We wouldn't want to withhold from allowing you to be blessed. Um, what else? I hope everyone had a good Mother's Day last week. I'm just waiting for the questions to come in. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that just, I hope you guys were touched by today's teaching. We really encourage you. If you're just tuning in, watch the beginning of it. Um, it'll bless you. It will encourage you. It will prosper you. And uh, we really thank, we thank everyone for tuning in, those of you who did. Um, we saw a few, I'll do a few shout outs. Uh, Ruben, Ruben Regalado, Hector, Mary, thank you, Mary, for tuning in. 
my dad, your mom, my grandparents, Delton, Erica. And there's a lot of people who tuned in today. Alan Kendrick. It's Alan Kendrick starting a church over in Alabama. No, Columbia, South Carolina. Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, their church is called Vivid Church. So I've been following along since they have started the journey. Um, so yeah, if you're a blessed, we thank you. Thank you for watching. And uh, stay tuned for this short little video at the end. And we will see you guys next week for our Friday Live Bible study. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you were blessed by this broadcast. If you need prayer, there are several ways to contact us. You can message us on our Instagram or on Facebook at deeprooted.mi. You can also visit our website to fill out a connect form at deeprootedministries.com slash connect. If you were blessed by today's teaching, we encourage you to support our ministry so we can reach even more people. Giving options are available to you online at deeprootedministries.com slash give. We love you, God bless you, and we will see you next week for our Friday Live Bible Study.